This presentation is intended to show how moderate exercise can improve both the physical and mental health of cancer patients. I don't have to tell you about the difficulties of living with cancer, but I can assure you that regular moderate exercise will improve your quality of life. Why I'm making this presentation is that it's a complex subject and I've been living with it for 16 years with a background in the sciences and athletics. And my focus has been on trying to maintain a good quality of life. And therefore, I can say to you with assurance that you should build regular exercise into your life. And this presentation will discuss what the benefits of that are, the demonstrative benefits, how much exercise you should do, what types of exercise, how hard you should exercise. And if you're overweight, that's a complicating factor that we will deal with. And at the end, I have a few personal suggestions from my own experience. This is not a new idea. 1900 years ago, it was already known that a healthy mind was linked to a healthy body. More recently, there has been a lot of study done on the subject to the point where 2,500 published scientific trials have been summarized by an international group and looking at the findings of health benefits. They do say overall that exercise is safe and well tolerated during and after cancer treatment. On the healthy mind side, they have strong evidence that exercise decreases anxiety and depression. Pretty important. Also that there's moderate evidence that it helps with sleep, improves sleep quality. And again, further study needed, but a good indication that it improves thinking processes. On the healthy body side, they found strong evidence for the things you'd expect, improved physical fitness and physical function, as well as improved quality of life. They found it decreases cancer-related fatigue and lymphedema. They have moderate evidence that it improves bone health. There are also studies that indicate that exercise reduces the list you see here, but further trials are needed to demonstrate it conclusively. Important in there is falls, which are a major cause of health failures in older people. I'm assuming that in the search for further trials, they will have very little trouble enlisting volunteers for the second last one. As a specific example of one of their studies, this study from Harvard shows a very important effect of moderate exercise like brisk walking on the mortality of older women. At this point, I have to say, be careful. You have to be sure that you are medically fit for the type of exercise that you want to undertake. The statement by the study was that for most people with low intensity exercise, no further tests or assessments were required. But if you're in any doubt that what you're doing is something you're fit to do, ask your physician. There is quite a strong consensus over how much exercise is required for health benefits. And it's broken into generally two categories, strength training, stretching, and balance, which I think of as preventing injury mostly, keeping you loose, keeping your muscle mass up, and then moderate to vigorous aerobic activity, which improves your body functions and which is responsible for many of the improvements listed by the study. The amounts that they suggest couple of days a week of the first category and a half an hour, five days a week 
of the moderate to vigorous aerobic are a target that you don't have to start out doing, but it is a desirable level. And of course, you can do more than that. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. The types of exercise, as mentioned, I've broken into two, the strength training, stretching and balance. It does fight loss of muscle mass, improves flexibility, it does all these good things, reducing joint pain, etc. The reduction of injury is important. The second set, aerobic exercise, improves cardiovascular fitness. And that's a big one. That's the one I'm focused on. And I use the first category as something that I need to do to do the second category safely. But when you're thinking about choosing your exercise, rule one, do something you enjoy. Don't do it because it's good for you if you don't enjoy it. Pick, there's lots of things that are good for you. Pick something that you enjoy. The strength training, stretching and balance exercises, as I mentioned, are essential to reduce injuries, especially if you're gonna be doing aerobic things where you're bouncing around and you need strong bones and muscles. The key thing to understand about aging from my perception of it is that you don't have a smooth downward curve of health deterioration. It's kind of a, and I say here, misstep function, because a misstep literally on a flight of stairs or literally anywhere else can cause a fall, which in older people is the beginning generally of some serious health issues. So what I'm saying mainly is to stay healthy, be careful to avoid falls, sprains, and back pain by doing your strength training and your stretching and balancing exercises. You can do these exercises at home alone and pretty much without equipment. And you can look up on the web instruction on how to do those things. On the other hand, group exercises motivate you. You have a social sort of contact contract almost with people to show up, which is beneficial. They also can provide you some equipment, show you technique, and there's a lot of providers of this sort of thing. YMCA, community groups, sports clubs, aquatic groups, all kinds of things, hiking groups. A Couple of examples of the sorts of things you can do at home with minimal equipment are shown here. All of these are good. The crunches and planks I do very regularly to strengthen my core. It helps me avoid back pain from doing the walking and jogging that is the main focus of my fitness efforts. You can see that even pull-ups can be done at home with a simple little bar that fits in the doorway. So there's no elaborate equipment required. Some examples of very simple equipment are resistance bands, barbells and exercise balls. I, for example, have rigged barbells over my treadmill so that periodically while I walk or jog, I can pull down the barbells and do arm exercises as I go. Also, as you can see, these things are often the basis of community exercises, group exercises. The stretching and balance examples also involve a lot more technique on occasion. Again, you can do things at home, but if you're going to do Pilates, yoga, Tai Chi, it's not the same thing getting that off the internet, getting instruction off the internet, as actually going to a place where there are, where there is expertise that can teach you proper techniques. The second category of exercise, aerobic exercise, as you would expect, increases your heart rate and your breathing rate. This is the main contributor to the benefits that are demonstrated for cardiovascular exercise. And they say in the study, moderate to vigorous. 
assuming that you're doing enough of the strength stretching and balance to avoid strains and back pain and so on, cardiovascular fitness becomes, in a sense, your main goal for overall fitness. But the first question that comes up is, what is the difference between moderate and vigorous aerobic exercise? You don't need any instruments or gadgets to tell you the difference between moderate and vigorous exercise. The Mayo Clinic has a very simple definition that says that moderate exercise, your breathing quickens, but you're not out of breath. You have a light sweat develop after about 10 minutes, and you could talk as you walk, but you couldn't sing, you're breathing too hard. If you're exercising vigorously, your breathing is deep and rapid, you develop a sweat much more quickly, and you can't say more than a few words without pausing for breath. Here are some examples of moderate exercise. The best thing I can do at this point is probably to be quiet for a moment and let you read down the list and realize how many of these things you already do and how many you might decide to do as part of your exercise routine. While you're exercising, it's important to be careful not to overexert yourself. You don't want to push yourself too hard or go too often. If you find yourself short of breath or dizzy or in pain, or you just can't sustain the workout as long as you planned, you're probably exercising too hard. Your intensity is higher than your fitness allows. So back off, build the intensity gradually. The simplest way to tell how hard you're exercising is to measure your heart rate. The most extreme one, of course, is if you are jogging, for example, or doing something vigorous and you start getting dizzy and your peripheral vision starts to go away, back off. I mean, that's the warning sign. It says you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain because you're working too hard. Your heart rate is probably excessive. But for normal circumstances, you can count your heart rate. The easy way is by hand on the wrist or the jugular vein. You can get a chest strap that'll keep track of it for you. You can get a readout from a smart watch that'll feed it, for example, to a smartphone. And if you're on a treadmill or something, there may well be handles you grasp to find out what your heart rate is doing. Once you know your heart rate, this table will give you a rough idea of what moderate and vigorous exercise will be for you. The way you use it, it's a rough standard, but you take 220 minus your age. In my case, I'm going to be generous and call myself 70. And that tells you that your maximum safe rate, heart rate, is about 150, as you see on the 70 line. That's flat out. As you get fit, you may be a bit above that, but that's the safe line. It also tells me that at age 70, moderate exercise, which is 50 to 70% of that maximum heart rate, would be 75 to 105. If my pulse gets above 105, I'm exercising vigorously. And then by about 130, I should back off. That's the limit for me for training. Now, the other subject that got mentioned up front, overweight comes into this thing because it has strong health consequences and exercise helps fight it. So we're going to talk a bit about overweight. The risks that are known are listed here. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, musculoskeletal disorders, of course, because you got a lot of weight on your bones. And it does contribute to some cancers. The World Health Organization measures overweight with the body mass index, and we'll get to exactly what that is shortly. 
first question is, are you overweight or obese? There are tests, there's a very exact test, DEXA, which is very precise and looks at your fat deposits in your body with dual energy x-rays. That's expensive, it's clinical. Hydrodensitometry also immerses you in a tank of water. It's reasonably accurate, but again, it's fairly elaborate. You can get on a balance on a scale in your bathroom, a percent fat readout on a smart scale, but those are very approximate, plus or minus, hmm, pick a number, probably 5%. So what we're gonna look at is the simplest standards you can look at to see whether you are overweight or obese. The first of these is just a tape measure. There are standards for it. You measure your waist. And based on this chart, which is in centimeters, but easily converted, you can get online charts like this that are in uh, inches if that's the way you, you work. But these charts will tell you, and they're very rough. I mean, bone density doesn't, you know, heights, there's all kinds of things that will contribute, but this is a rough guideline. If this tells you that you're in the high risk range, you're probably due for a bit of weight reduction. Another way to get a rough idea of whether you are or not overweight is an inexpensive pair of calipers. And again, there are standards online. This is the male and female standards, men and women. And you can see there's a slight difference. And you can also see the zones that are there by age. And of course, as before, height, bone density, all kinds of things contribute. So these are very approximate, but that shouldn't be much comfort to you if you're in the red zone. You really should lose some weight and aim for the green zone if you can. Finally, the one that the World Health Organization uses is the body mass index. The formula for it is your weight in kilograms divided by the square of your height in meters. And healthy is in the range of 20 to 25. As an example, I give my own weight 86 kilos. I'm 1.8 meters tall, so I have a BMI of 27. And if you look at the chart, you see that's in the overweight category, and I'm working on it. I have been lower, got away from me with some health issues, and I'm struggling to get it back down, which for me would be 81 kilos is where I hit 25 BMI. So I got work in front of me. I've lost a kilo since this chart was made. It's important to note that 21% of Canadian adults are over are obese, about half are overweight. So this is a very common issue, and it's something that you uh, should be concerned with. If you are overweight, the most obvious first step is to reduce your calorie intake. If I can get your attention away from those rather tempting looking foods in the picture there, they do represent unhealthy, unhealthy calories, sometimes called empty calories. And they make up 45% of Canadian adult diets. It's a bit shocking. There's a list there of the people most statistically likely to be eating them. And that's serious because the top 20% of the consumers of empty calories are 32% more obese than the bottom 20%. Obviously, if you are overweight, another solution is to burn more calories, since weight loss is a combination of reducing calorie intake and increasing the expenditure through exercise. Let's assume you're eating a healthy diet. The studies show that you can burn more calories with both moderate and vigorous exercise. It takes about 3,500 calories burned by exercise to reduce your weight by about a pound. The following two pages will give a rough guide 
on the levels of calorie burning that you will be doing with various sorts of exercise. For aerobic exercise, the best measure of the amount of calories you're burning comes from a thing called the basal metabolic rate. That is the consumption of calories in a day. The average basal metabolic rate for American women is 1400 calories. For men, it's 1800, which is 60 calories an hour on average for American women not being active, that's their basal rate. And for men, it's 75 calories an hour. So what we then look at are metabolic equivalent tasks. That is, what's the multiplier of the energy consumption of these tasks over just sitting around watching TV? So for example, strolling at three kilometers an hour is two and a half times as energy consumptive as watching television. These are, this list is the light intensity activities, which is to say up to three times the calorie burning of just sitting about. As we step up the level of aerobic exercise to higher intensity levels, we find that moderate intensity is three to six metabolic equivalents. And that is things like walking five kilometers an hour or six kilometers an hour or a stationary bike at low effort. Vigorous intensity is over six times as much calorie consumption as sitting watching TV. So for example, rope jumping at 10 metabolic equivalent tasks is saying that for the average female, rope jumping is burning 600 calories an hour and for the average male 750 calories an hour. I find this chart interesting because it's showing where the calories come from when you exercise and you see that there's quite a distinct difference between moderate exercise which is burning between 65 and 85% fat and vigorous exercise, which is burning between 65 and 100% carbs. The reason for that is that your body can only produce a relatively low level of energy on fat, burning fat. It's a difficult process for your body. It takes a lot of energy in and it can only move at a certain rate. When you have a demand for a lot of energy suddenly sprinting, your body has to just use carbs. And so the message I get from this chart is that even though your moderate exercise doesn't seem all that heavily consumptive, it's burning fat very effectively. To look a little more carefully at carbohydrate versus fat burning, what you see on this chart is that carbs are stored in the liver and in the muscles. The liver glycogen, it's called glycogen uh, in the liver, it's available for blood sugar and for the energy of your body in the muscles. It's basically just used for muscular activity once it's laid down there. It's readily converted to energy. If you're trained and you go through the proper regimen, you can in the week before a marathon do what's called carbo loading, which gives you a short term increase in the amount of glycogen you're storing. And that's your main source of high intensity energy. But in a marathon, for example, you will, it's called hit the wall when you run out of carbs because that's your high energy source. There's another thing that studies are showing that high dietary sugar levels may preferentially benefit cancer cell growth. The sugar is used by your body for all kinds of things, 
but cancer cells use it as fuel and there's some evidence that they gain more than they should from high dietary sugar levels. Fat, called lipid metabolism, is your major source of low-level energy. When you're just going through normal life, you're burning fat at a regular pace. It's harder to do than burning glycogen, and when you do hit the wall running a marathon, you don't just have to stop and fall down. You can carry on, but what you're now doing is having to just make do with the amount of energy that you can get from fat metabolism and from <laughs> breaking down your muscle cells. So the fat deposits on your body are a normal and regular source of energy. And they're different for males and females. But one thing people tend to not think about is that fat is an organ. It has functions that you don't think about. It produces hormones. It's pro-inflammatory. If you're subject to inflammatory diseases, having more fat is a problem. And it can become a chronic support for atherosclerosis and for diabetes. So it's another good reason for reducing your body fat. Now, I've indicated that moderate exercise is busy burning fat for you directly, which is a good thing. But it is also useful to do short, high-intensity intervals. If you're jogging, the Scandinavians call it fartlek go as you please, which is to say, you jog for a while, you come to a hill, you sprint up it, and then you go about jogging again. And that really improves your cardiovascular fitness. And when you do that, you'll get an increase in your levels of hemoglobin, muscle mitochondria, hormones that regulate it, bone strengthening, all these things are good. More complicated things going on, your DNA, as you age, is methylated. Methyl groups are attached to it in response to changes in your environment and just plain aging. And they cause a decline in your cellular metabolism, in your regular life force. It's reduced, this methylation, by high intensity exercise. Another thing that is also that benefits from it is that you have a thing called a brain derived neurotropic factor, but it's basically beneficial to the brain and it stimulates neurogenesis and cognition. All of these things are the results of some element of high intensity in your exercise. So mixing a bit in is a very useful thing to do. Now, as a person who's been puttering at this for a lifetime, I would like to just put in some of my own thoughts on it. First off, the vigorous exercise, as I've just said, should become a small but regular part of the daily routine. Fit it into your jogs, fit it into stair climbing, whatever, but a little bit of vigor is good. But you gotta moderate your, your vigorous, space it with moderate days, don't do too much of it. The rest days are as important as the exercise days. Your body's gotta recover. When you exercise vigorously, you, you tear muscle fibers, it happens. They, they do, they are damaged by heavy workouts and you need time for them to, to knit and, and prepare for activity again. So the rest days are important. And again, I have mentioned several times, stretching, balancing, core strengthening, these are essential because if you don't, you're gonna incur more injury. And stay hydrated. That's a really important thing to get benefit from exercise 
you want to have a water bottle handy. If you're running, take it with you. If you're doing something in one place, have one handy. Now, as a longtime runner jogger, I got a couple points I'd like to make. The main thing, if you just go and look at people out jogging, you're going to see them looking a lot more like the figure on the left there with the heel hitting the ground in front of the knee. That's overstriding. It means that their strides are too slow and too long. And it's hard on your body because the impact of that heel puts a shock right up through your ankles, knees, and hips. It's not a good thing. So what you want to do is run more like the figure on the right. And to do that, you just increase your cadence, shorten your stride, speed up your cadence, and you'll start to have your foot landing under or slightly behind your knee. And that's more efficient, and it'll give you a whole lot better running. The way I try to go at it is I measure how many times my, say, left foot hits the ground in a minute, and I try to be over 80 times, 160 strides, 80 paces in a minute. And I find it difficult to get above, say, 85 because it's technique. And to feel comfortable at a quick stride is not trivial. Most people overstride. They go too slowly and the strides are too long and it's hard on you. The other thing is you don't want to run too upright. You want to have your body as on the right there leaning into the stride a little bit. The reason that, you, and you want to keep that angle to the ground, whether you're running uphill, downhill, or on the flat, because the mechanics of running, where your hip is and the freedom of your legs to move is determined by that angle. And if you sit back running downhill or lean too far forward going uphill, you restrict your leg motion and make it inefficient. Now, there is an old saying, that which is measured improves. Anytime you want to get something improved, you got to track it to see what you're doing and how the results are from what you're doing and whether a little change in this or that gives you better results. And for exercise, the logical thing to do is keep a log. And this thing can be very simple, as you see. Just scrawl out what you did, keep a record of it, and then when you see how your weight is moving, when you see how you feel, you can look at the log and see whether you're due for a day of rest. You can look at the log to see if you haven't been doing enough. It's a very useful tool. It can be simple as the one I just showed, or it can be more complex. This is my log for the beginning of this year. And what I keep track of is how many kilometers a day I train and what the running total is for seven days. Have a brief description of what I did, the pace that I ran or jogged at or walked at, what my minimum pulse was overnight from a smartwatch, which gives me some idea if I've overtrained. You'll see that on the 16th of January, my pulse was 53, my lowest pulse, whereas on the 6th of January, it was 45. And so that tells me the day that I wake up and find my pulse only got down to 53, as you'll see, the 18th of January, I took the day off. When I'm down at 45, I put in a harder day. I track my weight. I track the uh, base, the uh, body mass index. And the core exercise there is, for example, for me, the 90 means 90 second plank. The 4BB is four sets of barbell exercises during a walk, and they take about 200 meters for each exercise. And then the 6040 is a set of crunches, 60, bit of a rest, 40. And the activity in kilometers is what my watch tells me my total activity for the day was. You don't have to be this anal retentive about your records, but you can. And if you do, it does help you to direct your own training. The other thing that a smartwatch will give you 
is a record of exactly when you were working out, the steps literally by the 10 minute period. It shows you your pulse throughout the 24 hour period, which is where I get my minimal pulse rate this particular day. I was down to 44, which means that I'd had a good rest. I hadn't been overdoing it. So after that day, I would go out and give it a, a harder work. And it shows you your sleep, which sometimes indicates that you are not healthy. If you really are overdoing things, you may not sleep well. So that's something that you can watch as well. The other thing about exercise is you don't have to go and do it. You can build it into your life. For example, I tell people I'd rather be a hamster than a couch potato because I watch sports and whatever on television on a treadmill rather than a coach. And it makes a big difference, of course, to the amount of exercise I get. It's also very handy during coronavirus that I can entertain myself while getting exercise and not be exposed. The other thing, little things, walk, don't drive. I mean, if you're going to the grocery store, learn to carry your groceries in a bag and don't drive there, if possible. I mean, maybe it isn't possible for you. For us, it's about a, oh, it's about a mile walk each way to the most regular store we go to almost two kilometers, uh, and we walk it all the time and we carry this stuff back. Use stairs rather than an elevator or escalator. Used to work on the 16th floor of a building and never used the elevator. I do find that having my memory gently failing with age is pretty useful. We live in a three-story house, basement and two stories, and the number of times that I go down a flight of stairs, can't remember what I went to get, go back up, remember it, go down and get it, and go back up again, that's kind of handy. Another thing that just is a no-brainer, sitting at a desk is not good for your health. So use a standing desk. I'm recording this thing at a standing desk that I built for myself, but you can buy them very simple ones like the one on the right there, or the one on the left is even just a module you can put on top of the desk you've already got. But when you're using them, do stand up straight. The other thing, and it isn't shown here, is that there is some evidence that it benefits your back to have a foot rest, like the bar rails, uh, six or eight inches off the ground, to al alternately put your feet up a little as you're standing there. It's supposed to be good for you. So in summary, I hope I've shown you that exercise is beneficial to cancer patients. I am strongly recommending that you do something you enjoy and do it regularly. You are looking for chances to build it into your routine, like using a standing desk, like walking on errands. You must include regular rest days because your body needs to repair after heavy exercise. That's as important as the exercise. I find keeping a log to track improvements is really helpful in planning ahead and not overdoing it and not underdoing it. There are all kinds of tools and instructions available for the type of exercise, the intensity of exercise, all that sort of thing, but they're not essential. You can get good exercise, just as I've shown you, with really simple things. And also exercising in groups when you're not social distancing for COVID-19 uh, does benefit you. There's a certain social pressure to be there, which is good. And there are people there who can teach you new skills. The benefit of all this for me has been that despite 16 years of cancer, four sets of chemo and a stem cell transplant, and now myelodysplastic syndrome, all of which are a bit of a battle, I'm still able to go out and enjoy the great outdoors. And that is invaluable improvement in quality of life.